I can have your attention. Hey guys, so I'm Dane Springmar. I'm going to talk about vector tiles as well, building off of Steve's talk, um, which was excellent and really provided both a foundation and some alternate examples to things I'm going to show. So some of this will be um, repeat, but uh, I'll diverge and talk about how vector tiles are working in the Mapbox stack and particularly in Tomil too. So I think you guys will get a lot out of this as well. Um, so yeah, Dane Springmar, I work for Mapbox, um, work remotely out of a uh, little town outside of Seattle. Um, and so what are vector tiles? Helpful if you missed the last talk or just to frame my conversation, my, uh, my premise. But I'm going to be talking about vector tiles as the data equivalent to image tiles, basically. Um, so they're like image tiles. They're easy to bake, distribute, and cache, which is awesome. But they're better. They're restylable. They can be smaller in some cases. They're very fast to create. You can convert them to many different formats after the fact. And there's a lot of creative optimizations you can do with vector tiles. Um, so the premise of why I'm working on vector tiles is that OSM data is too hard to access still. I mean, there's a lot of amazing ways and amazing APIs to get at OSM data. Um, CardoDB is one of my, my favorite new ones. But uh, it's still too hard to get live updating global OSM data, uh, particularly for uh, styling. So consuming image tiles is fast and easy. Why don't we just tile and bake the data itself is really the, the central question. And it's interesting, a tiled read-write API is quite desirable, I think, um, but it involves hard problems. So what if the official API were tiled, basically? Well, it's not yet. Maybe it will be in the future, and maybe many of us in this room will help work on that. But it is a hard problem. Geometries cross tiles. Do you clip and then reassemble them uh, for in editors? Uh, do you send just the IDs, or do you send all tags? How do you do this? How do you resolve conflicts across tiles? Um, and then if you do provide editors with tiles, do they reassemble them or do they uh, upload them individually and do you reassemble them and dedupe the information when you store it? These are hard problems to solve. So what I said is let's start on the easy part. Let's just start using vector tiles for rendering. Um, the central questions uh, then is can it be done at scale at no loss of cartographic quality and can rendering be distributed? Uh, massively? And the answer is yes. Because Mapbox Streets for the last three months is rendered now on the fly all the way up to Z19 and is backed by a live expiring Z0 to Z14 preceded vector tile cache. So we are using vector tiles in Mapbox Streets. Every tile you request is rendered dynamically. Uh, and if you make an edit on an editor, then 10 minutes uh, about uh, time will pass and the vector tile that's pre-cached will get updated. So yes, the answer is yes, this can be done. So how, um, um, how, how awesome is this, right? It allows our cartographers to worry about map, map making uh, and pure design again and not about data. Now they did put a big upfront effort into producing the vector tiles, but once they're done, you can make a lot of maps from it. These are a couple maps that uh, AJ Ashton uh, made and Ian made right after uh, the vector tile set was done. Same exact vector tile data set, but radically different styles. OK, so how do we do it? And the subtext is, how could OSM.org do this as well? How could we, as the OSM community, potentially prov provide vector tile services uh, that builds off of what Mike McGursky and Ian are offering on the OpenStreetMap server to increase OSM adoption and, and usage? If people can get it, uh, OSM data instantly like this and, it, and not only style it, but explore it in a cartographic way, I think that that could really increase uh, the viability of the project. So how do we do it? Well, we created a seamless open source uh, Mapnik toolchain that can both create and consume vector tiles uh, without leaving uh, C++, uh, which is for performance reasons. Um, so in this context, Mapnik is client, not the browser yet. Um, and that's a common question I get. The vector tile format that we've produced that I'll be talking to you about in more detail in the following slides could be used in web browsers, absolutely. But right now and for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be talking about why, uh, for performance reasons, we use Mapnik as client in this case. So the basic way that we deploy Mapnik now is, is this way. Mapnik renders image tiles, and to go get the data for image tiles, it grabs it from the file system or basically PostGIS. And this is hard or expensive to scale if you want to do dynamic rendering. Um, but this is a lot easier and cheaper to scale. Basically, what if Mapnik only had to go over HTTP to get a few tiles to render the images? 
Um, so then the, the rendering stack looks a little bit more like this. At the bottom, you have potentially just one Mapnik server that's also running PostGIS that creates vector tiles for everybody. That's the ravioli in the middle. And then you can have multi multiple different clients on different devices um, accessing those vector tiles from a cache. Uh, Mapnik uh, can run on mobile, can run on Android and iOS, or Mapnik can run like normally on a server, and that's what we're doing. Or in this case, Mapnik could easily provide a GeoJSON proxy for our vector tile format, which you'll learn soon is protobufs, which isn't the easiest thing to parse in browsers. So the Mapnik on server piece is what we've deployed um, for Mapbox Streets. We have um, an auto scaling infrastructure where, you know, at night maybe there's one uh, Mapnik server rendering all the tiles for the world, and, and during busy times there's uh, many, many Mapnik. Uh, servers that doesn't touch the file system. It just grabs tiles over HTTP and returns those to your browser as images. So we use a very efficient uh, format uh, encoded as protobufs. Uh, thank you, Google. And this is a format that's inspired by the Open Science Map Project, a very uh, beautiful uh, and fast-moving project uh, for rendering maps with vectors on Android. Um, so we encode multiple name layers uh, via, via your Mapnik or TileML style sheet, uh, and we support any data source format, not just OSM, which is a slight difference from how the Open Science Map project does it. They, they basically put in all OSM data with all the existing tags. We basically let the cartographer control the styling here, not, um, not only the visual styling in the end, but the cartographer controls the production of the vector tiles, and their arbitrary layers can be included. So if they want buildings, the cartographer decides that, not necessarily the programmer. Um, geometries are clipped to the tile boundaries very aggressively. Um, we do need a slight buffer around labeled features, however. Geometries are delta encoded, which basically means that from in-screen coordinates, we look at the integer position of every vertice um, rather than storing doubles, which uh, can save on a lot of bytes. And um, because we're encoding in protobufs, we use a zigzag encoding so that um, any signed integers then can be flipped um, and packed as uh, unsigned integers, which can save a number of bytes. Um, and then tags or attributes are dictionary encoded, uh, which allows us to only store uh, uh, both keys and values only once in the protobuf and point at them with integers, which is much more efficient. Uh, and the, one of the coolest things of all of vector tiles um, is they support overzooming. This is a term that we came up with internally. I don't know if this is the right term, but here's what I mean by it, basically. Is what if you only render a Z14 tile like we do? Well, you find if you don't simplify the geometries too much, then you can render every single tile beneath that up to about Z19 or Z20. And the neat thing is you uh, not only can render much higher zoom levels with Z14 or a, higher, uh, a lower zoom level, but you can render every zoom level in between using the same cache. Uh, so you cache Z14 once in whatever client render you are, and then every tile beneath that you can render on the fly. Um, Zover zooming, or this functionality, is amazing uh, to help you keep up with the OSM um, uh, change stream. So you have less zoom levels to watch for expiring tiles. If any of you are familiar with uh, the minutely map Mapnik or updatable uh, OpenStreetMap stack, you know how hard it is to keep up. Um, so if you only have to keep up at Z0 to Z14, you only have to keep up with a potentially 350 million changes or 350 million tiles that might be affected by any one change, right? Um, but if you had to keep up uh, the Z15 to Z19 range, you'd have to keep up with three, 360 billion tiles. Huge difference here. Um, vector tiles uh, are much smaller than GeoJSON and not much bigger than image tiles, like, like Steve said. And in this case, this is the case even uh, though our vector tiles are storing 23 layers and sometimes more. So uh, vector tiles, if they're only storing a GeoJSON, you know, one GeoJSON, uh, uh, for example, layer can be much smaller. But in our case, we're storing 23 layers because we have a vector tile that should be ready to style into a complete ba base map all in one go. So here's some actual numbers on that. If we were to take the Z13 tile um, for OpenStreetMap, uh, San Francisco, the tile on the left, upper left being Mapbox Streets, and the lower tile being the default Mapnik uh, style sheet on OSM.org. Um, those PNGs are about 33K. And the vector uh, tile as a, as a PBF um, and Zlib deflated is only 46K. So basically the same size as a PNG. Uh, and then when it's uh, not Zlibbed, it's 71 kilobytes, so not much bigger. 
Uh, and then how does that compare to GeoJSON of all of that? Well, GeoJSON um, with Zlib compression actually compresses pretty well, so 168 kilobytes, which is not too bad, but, but climbing. And then the GeoJSON raw that the browser ultimately has to unpack is almost a meg. Um, so that's for San Francisco, which has a, a lot of data. But what if we looked in one of the dense, most dense places in OpenStreetMap? And I'll give you a second to think if you know where it is. Cameroon. I don't know how to say this uh, spot in Cameroon, but the vector tiles in GeoJSON here are almost five megabytes. Um, but the vector uh, tile in our uh, protocol buffer is only 257K. Uh, and then the PNGs, for some reason, in this case, are smaller. Um, they compress really nicely for, for this area. Must be something with the ocean not compressing as well as you'd think. So again, that's for 23 layers fully ready to cartographically style is only 257K for the densest place currently in OpenStreetMap. So we feel like we're well prepared to scale to a much denser future. Um, and these tiles would be obviously much smaller if you wanted to distribute just a few different layers, not all 23. Um, but the system's designed to be fast. OK, so you're probably asking, where the heck is the code? Well, it's experimental, but it is all open source. Uh, so first off, Mapnik vector tile. Uh, is a repo on the Mapbox GitHub site. It's the lowest level C++ API for creating and consuming vector tiles. So you can take a Mapnik style sheet with this API and say, render that Mapnik style sheet into a vector tile. All, collapse all the layers and put it in a nicely compressed vector tile. And then you could take that exact vector tile, you could do it in memory, and then render it to a PNG. So this is how we first proto prototyped the, the experiment. Basically, we just inserted that step. It's kind of like taking the Mapnik tool chain that, that happens in it every time you save in TileMail and just breaking it in two and having a vector tile intermediary. And we deployed TileMail internally like that, and then we said, this is working great. Now let's break it up into a lot of reusable modules uh, and have those tiles actually live on S3 and have Mapnik live on a distributed set of auto-scaling render machines. So that's Mapnik vector tile, the core at C++. Um, and caveat is it requires Mapnik 2.2, which we released last week. Um, which is one reason I've been quiet until now of producing uh, a lot of documentation about where this lives, because I didn't want people to have too much trouble installing it. But Mapnik 2.2 is out, and this uh, depends on it. OK, Node Mapnik now has a, a branch that provides JavaScript bindings on top of this API. So you can do things as simple as just require Mapnik in JavaScript, create a new vector tile object, set its data. So the idea would be you'd go grab that via um, some URL where you've stored the vector tile, um, which is the proto message. And then you can render it. Uh, given a map, you can render that vector tile to an image, and then boom, return an image. So in, you could potentially have a vector tile server in just a couple lines of code. Uh, tile Live Vector um, is uh, an API for generating Mapnik vector tiles from traditional Ma Mapnik data sources. So basically, uh, a little higher level wrapper that does caching for you. Uh, I have the wrong URL there, but that's the URL for the next one, which is Tile Lab Bridge, which does the opposite. It generates image tiles from vector tiles. So these are the two uh, more higher level libraries that form the basis for TileMill 2. Uh, and TileMill 2 is our next version of TileMill and experimental at this point, but basically is a riff on what if all data came from remote vector tile services uh, and it was live updated, what would that uh, application look like? So quick demo of TileMail 2. You guys, if you saw uh, Artem's presentation this morning, you will have seen TileMail 2 briefly in action. But I want to show it to you again and just show you um, a few of those places in the world, like particularly Cameroon, and show you how fast it is. Um, because it is very fast. OK, I'm um, just going to load this up. I have a little shell script. So basically, that launched TileMail 2 on port 3000. I'm just going to check my time. Good. OK. So TileMill 2 can load in vector tiles from any data source. This is uh, natural earth bathymetry, for example. Um, and it's remote, remotely loading tiles and then rendering them, rendering them on the fly. See, it's pretty fast. But what about with a lot bigger data? Um, if you create a new sample project, it will load up a style sheet that styles OSM data. And this is the 23 layers vector tile. So you'll see some interesting things here. Um, we've decided to not show everything, just like Steve was describing. Have fairly simple layers uh, at the low zoom levels, but as you zoom in, you'll get more information uh, that will basically automatically appear in the vector tile. So if we were to zoom into San Francisco, you can see how fast it is. Uh, and at some point, we'll see the roads appear. 
and then the buildings appear. And just so you know, I'm not kidding you, I'll go find the buildings. Where are they? And I'll change the color. Pretty fast. Okay, but what about for a heavier data location in the world? Let's go to Cameroon. And again, this is all pulling tiles dynamically via S3 into Tile 2 on my desktop and then rendering them dynamically. So where's Cameroon? There it is. And this is one province in Cameroon that is dense. Check this out. There's the buildings. I'll turn them red pretty fast. And of course, now we can go into Z22 before everything hits some wall that I need to fix. But you get the idea. Um, yeah, so this is fast enough. Um, we have, if you go to the Mapnik Vector Tile repo on GitHub, you'll see we have a lot more ideas about ways to make the tiles smaller, uh, uh, compress them more, and render them quickly, more quickly, um, including looking at alternate formats than protobufs. Um, Google's Proto protobuf library is, uh, I think of it as an amazing workhorse, but the step where you actually take a big message uh, and, de and deserialize it is actually kind of slow. So we want to come up with a streaming way of doing that um, rather than get the message and have to uncompress the whole thing. Wouldn't it be great to just lazily uncompress the message whenever somebody asks for a certain layer? Because the idea in Tomel is you should be able to style the whole world and everything you want. Um, I should go into presentation view here. But you should also be able to use the same vector tile set and just comment out a bunch of stuff. Looks like that comment's not going to work. Uh. Um, so wouldn't it be great if you, had, if you were only looking at buildings to only fetch, just, uh, fetch and only decompress just the buildings layer? Um, but with the way the protobufs work is that's not quite possible right now. So we have ideas around that. Okay, so um, that's my Tamil 2 demo. And then I have one more slide, and it's a Mapnik on iOS demo. There was a question, what about Mapnik on iOS? And I have an answer for you. So I have an Xcode project that I will demo. Um, so basically, Mapnik runs on iOS as of the latest release, 2.2. Uh, and this is a bit of Objective-C native code um, that um, handles over zooming here, sets a scale factor depending on the, um, the device. Uh, and I will compile it and run it and show you what it looks like. So this is Mapbox Streets um, style on the device and then fetching vector tiles actually from a local cache in MB tiles. I'll just zoom into Seattle here because that's my de some demo, de demo data. See the buildings come in. Okay, and Steve made a really good point in the question of um, can you run Mapnik on iOS? He said, probably, but I'm not so sure about you know, whether you'd want to have these huge style sheets and how they would perform. And I absolutely agree with him. It would be great to have a much faster and simpler styling language invented if you're going to do on-device rendering. Because once you get that style sheet on there, you know it's not going to change. There's not cartographers running around your phone wanting to change it at every moment like there is in our offices. Um, but we don't have that perfect styling language or render implemented to use it yet. So this demo is saying, well, would it work? Could we put the whole Mapbox Streets XML style on the device and would it render? And this is what you're looking at. It's using vector tiles, which are really fast. Whoops. Um, but it's actually parsing a very large style sheet. And I'll show you what that looks like. It's about 600 lines of XML, 6,000 lines of XML. So there's obviously a lot of optimizations we could do here, but I'm pretty happy with the performance as we have it right now. Um, we're standing on the shoulders of giants here in this work. Um, there's a lot of people that have thought a lot about vector tiles um, before, uh, most notably Mike McGursky at Open Science Map and the Kothic JS project. So I encourage you to check out this terribly messy wiki that lists a lot of other projects. Um, and we'll be listed on there in due time once our uh, stuff is a little bit more documented. Uh, and I'd like to do a shout out to other team members that worked on me with this project. Artem uh, Young, Constantine, and AJ were instrumental in, in making this all fly. Um, and thank you very much. That's my talk. Cool.
Cool. Any questions? Yep, here in the front. Yeah. Yeah, the bit of overzooming code on the client says, are they requesting something within the range that I have pre-baked tiles that are exact dimensions? And once I hit Z15, then the math basically adjusts and says, okay, I'm going to give you back a Z15 tile, tile rendered at the exact dimensions, but I'm going to reach above me and I'm going to get the Z14 tile, zoom in to the right section of that Z14 tile, uh, and then render that, just that section, rather than the whole bit. So it's, it's sort of like clipping uh, and rendering on the fly. Yeah. Uh, and I, I have, uh, I'll preempt another question of, so wait, do you render on the client in a browser? We have sample code to do that, but one reason I haven't shared it yet is I haven't figured out how to do the overzooming clipping in the client yet. <laughs> it's a little tricky, but it's quite easy with the facilities we have in the Mapnik C++ library. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, hit me up after, and I'll show you the demo. Yeah, it's pretty pretty quick. Yeah. You're saying, are we doing OpenGL in Mapnik? Good question. Um, Mapnik has a pluggable infrastructure for different renders, uh, and we have a lot of different renders that we are thinking about using in the future, and one of them is definitely OpenGL. Uh, it's not written yet, though. So this demo that you're seeing is using the AGG software-based rendering. Um, so the limitations for speed because of that are basically two cores uh, on, on a mobile device. Yeah, so we, we could write an OpenGL back, back into Mapnik, and that's been discussed. Um, might happen in the future. Follow-up question? Yeah. 2D only? Yeah, right now. Um, yeah, in the front. Uh, not yet. It will be soon. Right there? Yeah, good question. Um, I haven't benchmarked very closely, um, but it should be fairly comparable. Um, I, I have gotten shapefile-based rendering working on device and on the simulator, um, uh, but I haven't, I haven't compared. So um, yeah, the main reason that uh, you'd want to use vector tiles is if you have, obviously, hundreds or thousands of Mapnik clients on servers, and so they can just request a cache tile, whereas they can't all reach across the network and, and request a shapefile. But yeah, if you're, if you're on a device, there's no reason that a shapefile wouldn't work great. The one trick is that Mapnik, um, by default, the build uh, memory tries to memory map shapefiles, which uh, is probably going to fail on iOS because of the shared memory restrictions. So you have to turn that off in the build. And the Mapnik iOS binaries that we provide on mapnik.org does have that turned off, but just be aware if you compile it yourself. So yeah, uh, shapefile should work great to read locally, SQLite, you know, anything that runs on iOS. Other questions? How much time do I have? Right here, Zeke. Nice grin, by the way. How much does it cost? Yeah, well, the underlying business model here was that previous to supporting overzooming, I still have the slide up, so it's relevant. Previous to supporting overzooming, we were pre-caching a lot of tiles. And we're a small company that wants to run really fast, um, and we want to do a lot bigger things as the weeks pass. So that was an expense that we wanted to remove. So um, I'm answering your question in a backward way, but we don't pre-cache anymore. We render on the fly, uh, and it's quite fast. So that opens up a lot of fun things to work on um, and some new business models that you'll see us entering into. So um, this is cheap and, and exciting. Um, yeah. Yeah, in the back.
Yeah. Very good question. Um, I should show you my early demos. <laughs> there are a lot of artifacts. Um, the way we do it is a one pixel buffer. Solves all problems. <laughs> so, so if that doesn't make sense, or basically you just, the answer to that question is uh, a little secret of why I have ravioli on my title slide, is that I think of vector tiles as ravioli in a lot of ways, um, but specifically, they're a better format for distributing data. Tastes better, of course, when you can get it this easily. But also, they have this little wavy edge, which is the little extra on the, on the edge that you, you pack with the vector tile, and then you clip off. Um, again, something that's very, very easy to do in C++ land in Mapnik because it's a spatial library. A um, little trickier to do on the fly in a client if you're in a web browser with WebGL, but definitely doable. Um, and you could do that same exact thing to avoid artifacts in Canvas if you were doing it. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the not needing many zoom levels is uh, the best. Um, let me show you, so this is a MB tiles that's storing nothing but vector tiles um, for Seattle, um, Z19, and it's 117 megabytes. And the one next to it, another demo one I have, is the whole world, Z0 to 8, uh, 270 70 megs. So um, the whole world, Z0 to um, 14, is only about 30 to 35 gigs. So it's very, very easy to run a whole rendering stack offline on a Raspberry Pi even. Um, the big caveat is that it took us, took a lot of effort. Um, that's the flip side of how I didn't answer your question honestly is where, is the, where are the costs here? The costs for us obviously were large and figuring out, okay, how does this all work? How do we all tie it together? But that was fun. But then we realized, oh my, oh my we're going to have to spend a lot of time um, curating our style sheet. We, throughout our style sheet for Mapbox Streets, we were selecting, in a lot of places, twice as much data as you ultimately even saw on the style sheet. So to get the MB tiles for the whole world, Z0 to 14, we spent um, months writing smarter queries to make sure that we were not sending too much data to Mapnik. So I, I don't have a good estimate, but if you were careless, you could end up with prohibitively large vector tile stash. Even though they're very optimized format, you can put too much data in them, in them is basically what I was trying to say. And that was, a, that was a big upfront cost, but as you saw from some of the styles that we've been able to do with it, it was a worthwhile upfront cost. And we're excited to share it with everyone because uh, if you use Tomil 2, uh, the months of work um, that we put into this to the vector tile curation shows up in Tomil too. Yeah. The question is, why did you pick Zoom 14 rather than 15? Um, it just looked decent enough for our, our use cases, just trial and error, basically. Um, the the critical thing though is that you once you we might have decided fairly arbitrary, uh, looks good at 14. Um, but the critical thing is once you decide that, you need to turn off a few simplification uh, uh, thresholds at Z14. Because uh, for example, at Z13 and above, we know we're not gonna re try to reuse those tiles at a deeper level. So we can very aggressively uh, simplify the geometries in those tiles. Um, but then if the Z14 is the last one, we, we turn off the tolerances that throw out, a light, uh, throw out for example, coincident vertices. Um, so it didn't really matter. Um, we probably could have done Z13 or, or 15, but you got to decide which one you're going to do and go with it. OK. Great questions, you guys. I think, I think I'll call it right there.